Hi, Dr. H here. This video will be a review of the important chemistry concepts which you should know as we move through our course. Uh, the basic unit of chemistry which we'll be studying is the atom. Okay, and this here uh, is a very simple model of a very simple atom. This is a helium atom actually. Uh, in the center here, this is the nucleus of the atom and it is made up of two subatomic particles, uh, the neutrons here which are green uh, and have a neutral charge or no charge and the protons here which are red and have a positive charge, okay, neutron N for neutral, P proton P for positive. Uh, and this is where most or almost all of the mass of the atom is found. Orbiting around out here uh, in different what are called shells around the nucleus are the electrons. And as the sign here indicates, they have a negative charge and just about no mass. In fact, they're so light that we really don't even count them. Uh, the elements are organized in the periodic table. Uh, here we see uh, one representation of the periodic table. Um, and if we zoom in a little closer, we see uh, we have the chemical symbols. C B is boron, C is carbon, N is nitrogen. Uh, and these numbers here, uh, we'll come back to. This is a very important number uh, for us when we get into chemical bonding. Uh, but there are also two other numbers uh, associated with each element that you should be aware of. One is the atomic number and the other is the atomic mass. And you should be familiar with those and how they are found and calculated and what exactly they mean. Um, if you're not, you should, should certainly go back and look that up. When we talk about biology, though, uh, and the chemistry of biology, we really can simplify the periodic table, uh, pretty much down to just this. Uh, we don't find all of those elements in living things. Um, and in fact, if we really look very closely at uh, the human body, we see that the, the big four here make up the vast majority of the dry mass of the, of the human body. Uh, actually, I'm not even sure this is dry mass. This may include water. Uh, the oxygen, 65%, uh, carbon, uh, almost 20%. So there you have almost 85% of your body is made up of these two elements. And then hydrogen and nitrogen, uh, fairly large, fairly uh, large amounts uh, in compared to the other minor elements here. Uh, certainly calcium and phosphorus we found in the bones and the teeth, uh, sulfur in some proteins, uh, sodium and chlorine, probably most of those are found together in the form of salt. Uh, but these four, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, are the big four that we will be uh, concerned about in terms of biology. So when you look at an atom, uh, the electrons are arranged in these kind of shells, these rings. And this is uh, one just way to look at it. This is an argon atom. Argon has three shells of electrons. Uh, and these shells have certain numbers of spaces for electrons within them. Uh, the first shell here has two spots for electrons, so it can hold two and then it's full. And then if you want to add the third electron, it has to go out into the second shell. And that shell can hold up to eight electrons. And the third shell can hold up to eight electrons. And if you notice, argon here uh, has eight electrons in this third shell. So its third shell is full. Uh, that means that this atom is, this element is unreactive. Okay, the reactivity of the elements is mainly determined by the number of electrons in the outermost shell here. If we contrast that with something like carbon. Carbon has six electrons, two in the first shell and only four in the outermost shell. Now the reason that these atoms, that these elements will react is because they want to get to a stable state. Or I shouldn't say they want to, but they are moving towards a stable state. And that stable state is a full outer shell. So there's a couple ways that they can do this. Well, really, the way that they do this is they enter into chemical bonds. And there are two different types of chemical bonds. Uh, going back to our periodic table, we see that th this number here, 
uh, which I kind of mentioned before. This number is what's called the electronegativity of the atom. And if you look at the periodic table, you can see the upper rightmost corner here is very highly electronegative atoms. The bottom most or bottom leftmost corner down here is very low electronegativity. Uh, to think of this in a very simple manner, electronegativity is sort of how much pull does the nucleus of the atom have on its electrons? How tightly are those electrons held there? Um, so fluorine here with an electronegativity of 4.0 holds on to its electrons very, very tightly. It does not want to give them up. Whereas down here, uh, something like francium uh, has a very, very low electronegativity. Its electrons are ready to fly off. Okay, it will give, its, give up its electrons very, very easily. So this number has a very large effect on the type of chemical bond that the element will enter into. So if you have two elements that have very, very different electronegativity, so let's say sodium and chlorine, for example, let's go back here and look. So sodium is 0 0.9, so that's relatively low electronegativity. Uh, chlorine over here is 3.0, so that's relatively high. So we have a, a very large difference in electronegativities. Chlorine is going to be pulling very hard on its electrons. Sodium, not so much. So when they get together, what's going to happen is chlorine will actually be able to pull this electron away from the sodium and add it to itself. This results in sodium becoming a positive ion because uh, it lost an electron, so now there's one extra proton, so it has a positive charge. Chlorine now becomes the chloride ion because it, because it now has a negative charge because it gained a negative electron. These two ions now, the positive sodium and the negative chlorine, will attract each other. Okay, positive and negative charges attract each other, and that attraction is what's called an ionic bond. Okay, and this happens in salts. Okay, sodium chloride, very, very common, simple table salt. Okay, so when you have two atoms, very different in electronegativities, one will pull the electron from the other one, it'll form into an ionic bond. What if you have electronegativities that are very similar or even exactly the same. Uh, going back to our example of fluorine, fluorine is actually what we call a diatomic molecule. It, two fluorine atoms will form a bond with each other. Now obviously since the electronegativities are the same, it's not going to be able to, one fluorine atom will not pull the electron from the other. So what they will do is they will share their electrons. Okay. It just so happens that fluorine has seven electrons in its outermost shell. Remember, that to be stable, that should be full, so it wants eight. So the two fluorine atoms come together and they share their electrons in this outermost shell. And this sharing of electrons is what we call a covalent bond. Okay, and it's a very, very strong bond. It's very hard to get these two atoms to come apart. In an ionic bond, you can get those sodium and chlorines apart very easily. Just put salt in some water and the sodium and chloride ions come apart. Fluorine will stick together very, very tightly and very hard to get that, that, those apart. Now, because the electron negativities are the same, they will be sharing these electrons evenly. One atom, one nu nucleus will not be able to pull the electrons closer to it than another, so they will share very evenly. You can also see this type of bonding happening with carbon. Here we have carbon bound to four hydrogen atoms. Okay, and we'll talk much more about carbon bonding. That we'll do a whole entire chapter just on carbon bonding. But you can see here, carbon is able to form four covalent bonds, and that's a very important property uh, for the chemistry of carbon. But what if we have two atoms which are, the electronegativities are kind of far apart, but they're not so far apart where one can just pull the electrons from the other one. 
So let's take uh, high, uh, oxygen here at 3.5 and hydrogen at 2.1. So they're kind of far apart, but they're not so far as we looked, saw with sodium and uh, chlorine. What happens there is you have this what we call an unequal sharing. Okay, oxygen here, this big red atom in the middle here, is able to pull the electrons closer to it than the two, two hydrogen atoms can. And hopefully you all recognize this as a water molecule. This is H2O. So the electrons tend to spend more time around the oxygen atom than they do around either hydrogen atom. So that leads to uh, the electrons kind of being pulled up this way. So there is a polarity to this molecule and to these bonds. And these are actually called polar covalent bonds. So in a water molecule, the oxygen end of the molecule up here has a slight negative charge. It's not a full negative charge. We call it a partial negative charge uh, because the electrons kind of spend more time up there around the oxygen than they do down around the hydrogens. And that means that the hydrogens here, these ends, have partial positive charges to offset this partial negative up here. What that means, when you get a bunch of water molecules together, they will arrange themselves in a certain orientation. Okay, so here we have a water molecule. Uh, this little symbol here that they used an 8 for, but it really should be a lowercase delta, uh, means partial. So here we have the partial negative charge on this hydrogen, <clears throat> partial, partial negative charge up here on the oxygen, it's a partial negative, this is partial positive on the hydrogen partial negative up here on the oxygen, and these attract each other. Okay, and this bond right here is called a hydrogen bond. Very, very important type of bond in chemistry and in biology. And water is a very important molecule. Yet there is a whole chapter on the chemistry of water and why this, these bonds are so important and all of the important properties that arise because of these hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds form not, not only in water, but anytime you have a polar covalent bond. So two atoms bonded together with electron, electronegativities not quite far enough apart where it forms an ionic bond, where one atom can pull the electrons completely away from each other, but it is strong enough to pull the electrons more towards itself. So they're still sharing. Okay, this is still a covalent bond. The electrons are still shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen, but oxygen doesn't share nicely. It takes the electrons more. A very important concept which we will be coming back to quite a bit in our chapter on water. Okay, so that is the end of the review. Uh, hopefully this helped you guys out. If there's anything you're not sure of, I would definitely go back and look at the chapter in the textbook.